Hello everyone, uh, good evening and um, welcome to the latest instalment of conversations between uh, filmmakers at the Folk Film Gathering. Um, my name is Will Higby, I'm a professor in film studies at the University of Exeter and I'm really delighted to have been um, invited by uh, Transgressive North to chair this um, conversation between two inspiring and politically conscious filmmakers, um, Nadir Pumush from Morocco and Elisa Sepedal from Asturias in Spain. I'm, I'm hoping that you've already had a chance to see their films that have been included in the festival and they're, they're really fantastic films. Um, Elisa's work, film um, work, What to Whom the World Belongs, is one that observes a mining community in northern Spain contemplating the socioeconomic forces that have um, precipitated the decline of the mining industry and its impact on a sense of collective identity in the region. And Nadir's film Amusu, uh, which is collectively authored by, by the director with the people of Vimadir, which is a small Amazigh community in southeast Morocco, um, depicts the, the Imadir's resistance to the exploitation of the land, resources and people of the region by a um, transnational mining corporation, as well as exposing the Moroccan authorities' complicity in these activities. Um, I think these are films that fit um, fantastically well with this year's um, Folk Film Gathering's central theme of solidarity in a film festival that celebrates the differences and considers the points of commonality found in a range of films from across the world made by and for the people. Um, as well as offering a model for how political and collaborative filmmaking can successfully function, both documentaries are also beautiful and accomplished forms of cinematic expression. And I'm really looking forward to seeing where this evening's conversation between Elisa and Nadir takes us in relation to questions of folk cinema and the political as well as the challenges and rewards offered by collaborative and participatory filmmaking. Um, so thanks again to Elisa and Nadia for agreeing to participate in this session and a really warm welcome to both of you as um, our, our filmmakers in conversation for this evening. Well, hi um, everyone and thanks Will. I'm really delighted to, to be invited in, in this festival and, and sharing this conversation with, with you and Nadia, whose film I, I really, really liked. Um, Thank you so much, Will. And uh, same, same goes for me, Elisa. Okay, so just before we, we get started and jump into the, the, the conversation, um, the, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, the session, as you probably will have already noticed, is being recorded and, and everyone who's present on the call, except for, for, for our speakers and, and myself, are muted and with cameras off. Um, Live captions will be available uh, through the live transcript button, which you should find at the bottom of your menu, which you need to click and activate if you want to have um, if you want to have the, um, the the live captions. You'll also find a set of instructions in the chat um, for how to access that if you have any problems. Um, we, if you want to ask a question, we, we we welcome that, and we'd encourage you to place that question in the chat, and then we'll do our best to get to those questions later. So if you have something you want to ask or a comment you want to make to join in the um, in the conversation, then please put that in the chat and I will keep an eye on that and we can get to that. Um, so we, we also, the conversation will run for about 90 minutes. Um, we, we kind of got, we have a hard stop at um, 8.30, so we'll be, we'll be sticking to that, but um, plenty of time for what I hope is going to be a really rich conversation and one which is kind of between Elisa and Nadir predominantly with me just sort of um, being as sort of uh, as unobtrusive as possible. Um, so should we dive right in with um, a question about the collaborative and collective nature of the filmmaking process, both in Amusu and in work or to whom the world belongs. I wonder if we could start with Nadir on this one and if you could just begin by telling our audience about how um, you worked in collaboration with the people of Imidil in your film and Elisa, as I said, you know, this is a conversation and feel free to respond or join in with Nadir as and when you see fit. But perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that process of, of working collaboratively on, on Amusu, Nadir. Yeah, um, so Amusu was, was produced by the, in, through what we call EGRO, which is the, um, the traditional general assembly that uh, that uh, many communities in Morocco used to uh, organize themselves politically before uh, what France calls uh, pacification, 
uh, which is actually just a euphemism for a, a war of conquest against uh, tribes that were previously uncontrolled by the Sultan or by any um, uh, centralized authority, uh, authority or power. Um, so um, basically, it was a, it was a, it was a form of uh, direct democracy. So when um, when I got to Emir of the first time, I mean, I already, I'd already heard about Egro, um, and it just made sense to uh, basically work through this general assembly to uh, which was already being used to make decisions about the, the movement, the, 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 the peasants movement there against the mining company to make the decisions about the movement, about which actions to take next, uh, who to assign certain roles like communications or uh, negotiations with the mine, etc. So it's a, it was a very horizontal uh, or non hierarchical um, structure, which kind of fit well with my own ideological uh, beliefs. Uh, so it just kind of made sense to to um, make this uh, body of, of uh, villagers as the producer, uh, instead of going say to a production company uh, or, or even as most Moroccan films are made by through production companies uh, abroad as well through co-productions, uh, we thought it would be best to keep um, the film that such a, produ a production process like this would allow for the film to reflect their uh, their view on things um, without any uh, influence uh, from uh, the bosses. Um, so, uh, uh, and basically uh, after that, there were committees uh, for the day-to-day -day tasks. There were committees that were, that were uh, appointed by this body to, to accompany me during the day-to-day -day ta tasks of the film, like overlooking budgets. Uh, there were also agros for writing where people could contribute directly to the creative process. Uh, agros for montage where they could uh, contribute directly to the editing process and also whether the editing reflects their own, um, how they see themselves. And the idea was to translate, uh, uh, to translate their, uh, their own experiences uh, through, through these, pro these different um, uh, through these different means of, 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 of uh, gathering and discussion. And it was just basically trying to find consensus. It takes a longer time, of course, because it's easy to be an authoritarian and just tell people what to do and what you want to do and just have them sign release forms. Um, but uh, but I, uh, democracy takes time in general. So uh, that's okay with me. Um, and I mean, just going to talk about another use film before I talk to mine, I'm, I'm quite interested about the way that I think perhaps what he's describing as the way they organize the film production kind of reflects and correct me if I'm wrong, the modes and the means of organization of the tribes that you filmed. Exactly. I, mean, I, I saw how, you know, um, in the community that you document, there, there is no like hierarchy and that men and women seem to contribute equally. And I was just wondering whether these form of organization is based on the very resistance of the community or whether, um, or whether these form of organization sort of precedes that uh, 1996 protest that, that is talked about in the film. Because I think I read somewhere that perhaps you know that these tribes kind of organize um like that or this is like an ancient form of organization and that precedes the modern state but i'm, I'm quite interested in, in 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 this idea yeah exactly the so the the structure the sort of um uh, direct democracy structures existed in so uh before the colonial period morocco was basically some historians say that was divided into two sec two zones one is what we call bled l'mukhsin, or the land of the states, or the land of the treasury, or where the taxes are stored. Um, the mukhsin is the place where the taxes are stored, and bled siba, which is basically all these, the, the majority of the, the, the country, and uh, it was places that were uncontrolled by the, the central state, or places where the sultan could not collect taxes. And so you had uh, different kind of models that existed in different tribes. And this one is just one of the, the models. You, you had less democratic tribes, you had more democratic tribes. 
Um, but the, the image specifically, there was a confederation of tribes, which would you ha have like the, the, the confederation and then the sub tribes and then the sub sub tribes. And basically they would send delegates, not uh, representatives, but delegates up from these structures. So you have uh, uh, these kind of general assemblies at different levels, but the, the, ba the base level is the one that takes the decisions. They, they, they're just delegates. They can't actually make the decisions. So, uh, yeah, that, that's basically where, where uh, Imidr brings it back. Uh, of course, these, this was killed off by the modern state, which mm -hmm. tried to fight this kind of structure. Uh, I mean, the colonial states, then the, the modern nation state, uh, none of them have interest in have, giving people direct democracy. Um, so uh, by, by reviving this, it's, a, it's an act of resistance uh, in itself. Um, so I hope that answers your, your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I guess in, in a way I kind of envy uh, that community in which I see my own community reflected, but perhaps like a long time ago, because um, I guess like in Asturias before kind of uh, neoliberalism swept away with class consciousness, um, there were attempts by the minor communities to organize autonomously, and they did so during the Franco regime, um, uh, they organized in clandestinity, and, and I guess more significantly, there was a, there was a Asturian commune in 1934, there was a miners' revolution, which I think is, is the last um, uh, workers' revolution in, in, uh, in Western Europe. Um, so in a way, I envy the fact that the community in your film still um, leaves from that form of organization and, and from the very resistance. Whereas I feel that I documented the end of that way of that form of living in mine. And I, I don't see how that, that would happen again. Um, and so talking about your question now, Will, I think that I, didn't have such a collective approach as Nadir's, uh, but I did. I did work very closely with a small group of, of miners, um, and this small group of miners they sort of left the major unions um, as they were quite unhappy with their their mo in the ways in which they they sort of executed power and they kind of undermined the working class ultimately after. 40 years of, of a period of the industrialization in which the major unions gained a lot of power and the uh, undermined the working class. So there were a, a few, uh, a, a small group of miners that were quite unhappy um, and they wanted to, to have a more, um, an approach that reflected a, a real democracy and assembly in which they all have voices and they didn't have a, a hierarchy. So I approached this group of miners and and they were pretty involved in the film. So they, they I attended loads of their assemblies. Yeah, I was going to say, is that, is that the, the group who you film having an extended discussion near the end, near the end of the... Yeah. Of the doc? Yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, it was a long process. Like we, 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 we kind of like hung out for a couple of years and you know we, we wrote scenes together we we recreate we recreated some scenes together which didn't end up in in the film um but th they were quite involved um you know although ultimately you know i edited the film myself uh, and so on but i yeah i feel that they're quite quite involved but even though there was a kind of smaller a group surrounding you in, in contrast to the, to the wider community that, that, that Nadir was working with. It's still a sense of that collaborative process and working closely with the, with, with the, the community. And I think that also, um, you know, there is a real sense in both films of, of, of community or, or an idea of the people that's embedded in the filmmaking. I mean, how, how conscious were, were you of that as you were, as you were making the film? Because there's also the historical perspective that comes in your, in your film as well. You know, that idea of, of the people and of community as a kind of, draw, as a, as a kind of key reference point in, in, your, in your film. Well, for me, it was, it was uh, fundamental to show 
the whole community and not just make it about the miners because ultimately the whole economy was very much based indirectly on, on the coal mines. Um, and so I wanted to portray the everyday life of, of this place as well as, you know, the issues of the working class struggles and so on. Um, so I, I do, I, yeah, I, I wanted to emphasize, you know, what people do, how they work, and especially um, sort of contrast the way of living today of that community in decline, which has lost class consciousness, you know, and, and, and sort of contrast that to some historical events in which that describe really this uh, working class movement and when they did have class consciousness. Uh, because I guess that that was the fundamental question for me that kind of um, was with me throughout the process and that kind of led the decision the decision making is that how can I um, how can I document or how can I uh, articulate the loss of this of the class consciousness in this community which is something that it was happened it, it, it was there during during many decades and then it sort of vanished um, yeah. I don't know if I answer your question. No, 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 you did. I think it's, um, and, but I think again, there's a sort of, I don't know if you want to come in there on that point, Nadia, about the, the way in which an idea of the, the, the sort of the people or community was in, embedded in your filmmaking, not just through the, the actual, through Agrao and through the, 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 pro, the kind of decision making and so forth, but also an idea of, um, I suppose also the people as a site of resistance, right? Because that's, that's key in, in, in both films. That's, that's the thing is if there is a resistance, um, then it's easier to do the kind of uh, uh, collective work that we did with, with in Imeda. Um, but I would understand in, in, in Elisa's context because there's fragmentation between the workers that it's harder to get such, uh, such a big group together. Uh, and that's actually towards the, the later phases of Amusu. Uh, there were in, uh, infiltrators that started breaking up the movement from within. And so that's when, that's precisely when we started getting a lot less involvement in, in the agros. Uh, and because the community itself was being fragmented, then you finally end up with a small group, right? Right now, until this day, in terms of distribution and where the film is going, there's still a small group, but that's kind of uh, uh, that's the result of this fragmentation is that in the end you, you're not going to be able to work with everybody all the time and, and now I'm working on another project it's, just a, it's a community where there isn't any resist you know collective major resistance so it's difficult to work with a large group so I had to reduce it to a I mean it's still collective uh, work but to a much more reduced scale so I think it you know once you have like a sort of um, uh, autonomous zone or a place where you know where you can organize these things um, where you have spaces where people gather uh, on a regular basis to talk about their issues uh, without that you're not going to go anywhere um, I mean you can't repeat this, this kind of experience that we had in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Meda. I don't know if you felt the same way Elisa that maybe this 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 fragmentation was uh, would have made it uh, almost impossible to kind of do a sort of large scale uh, because there is no uh, class consciousness, as you said, et cetera. Yeah, no, it was impossible. I mean, when I started doing my research, I tried to talk to everyone, but then you, you realize um, how much anger there is between parties from all the years of uh, sort of the major unions undermining the workers and gaining power and so on. Um, so it, it was really hard to to gather people together, and and also because I wanted to to talk about the effects of this long process of reindustrial of the industrialization and not the causes. So I didn't want to start, you know, um, putting the blame of, on anyone, um, and and I found it hard to approach certain people in the mayor unions. Um, because they have that power and they didn't want certain things to be reflected in the film. So I, I felt that I didn't have the freedom with them that I had with this small group of miners that had really nothing to lose. Um, 
Uh, and also, yeah, totally, this fragmentation comes from the fact of the, you know, the loss of the class consciousness in, because there is, there isn't, the people is no longer there, it's sort of missing. So um, it can be reflected because as I was saying before, the end of this uh, long industry uh, just came to an end and there is no such thing as a working class movement anymore. So it cannot be articulated anymore. Um, yeah, you, I mean, Nadir, you said an interesting thing about resistance, and and actually, there's a there's a there's a, a line from the narrator in in your film, isn't there, Lisa, where which says where there where there is power, there is resistance. So, yeah. do, would you would you both say that you think that that sort of reflecting on that statement? Do you think resistance is what defines political cinema? That's the kind of that's the the, the key kind of starting point, and. More generally, what what for you is the function of, of of political cinema, and what kind of political cinema do we do we have today? Do you think, in your experience? Yes, um, oh, sorry, no. Well, I, a question for either either of you. You're both too polite, Nadir. Do you want <laughs> to start? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I wouldn't say the resistance is what defines political cinema because. Um, uh, you know, films like uh, Birth of the Nation or, uh, you know, these colonial films that were produced about uh, Morocco that showed us as um, savages were very much political films, but um, they were not engaging in any sort of what I would call uh, resistance, maybe resistance against uh, um, being humane, but um, yet they're still political films. Um, so I, I would, yeah, I would say that political, I, I, I would say that all cinema is political, even, you know, even um, cinema that claims to be apolitical is political. Um, it, it carries ideology and even those who pretend, especially when you're watching realist films that show social issues and then the filmmaker, and this, is, this, this has become very common. Um, you hear the filmmakers say, well, I'm not, you know, taking a political position. Uh, it's just a universal message. Uh, so that's, that, in, that in itself is, I think, uh, very much an expression of neoliberal ideology. Um, because in the sense that, you know, we just say, well, we don't care about this ideology or this ideology. But, you know, it's, it's the market that drives the, the filmmaker to what kind of film they make and which audience they appeal to, etc. So uh, that's, yeah, I wouldn't say resistance uh, the, the fine. Yeah, for me, I see it as, and, and I think that's why I think these two films resonate because resistance sort of runs through both of the films and because they are about communities who resist. And I'm really interested in looking at the ways in which cinema can resist. Um, and then what does it mean to make a cinema resistant? Does it exist merely uh, when we document the struggles of communities that resist? Or does it go beyond that? Do we have to look in the ways that we produce, we distribute films? Do we have to look at the film's form? Um, and I think, you know, the, all these questions are, are reflected in both of our films. Um, in my case specifically, I think I was trying to be experimental with the form, uh, trying to find the form of the film while I was making it, as opposed to, I guess, talking about my previous practice, which, which was based on, on fiction. Um, so for me, it was being open to experimentation and, and also in a way, I guess, making, the form of the film political was rejecting a kind of cinema um, as a means of like transmitting information or feelings and, and, and I guess embracing an ontology of cinema uh, as an effective and experimental field between the visual and the sound. And, and so for me it was, was a matter of, of avoiding uh, conventional film uh, conceptions you know, the, the spectator identification with the characters, these Aristotelian um, construction of the film with the beginning, the middle and the end, uh, the cause and effect and, and the character's motivation and so on. Uh, and it was a matter of making 
uh, a choral film in construction uh, with a collective protagonist using a multiplication of point of views of different materials like voiceover, archive footage of film and so on. And, and, and I guess using montage specifically in this film, I was concerned of, of using it not as a tool that as a mechanism that vertebrates the story or as a tool uh, for continuity, but rather as a mechanism that shows us what is between the images and, and that reveals the form of the film itself. Um, yeah. I can relate to this choral uh, sort of aspect in uh, terms of uh, also about the uh, character identification, how we're supposed to identify with a sort of protagonist, even in documentary, it's become kind of a la mode uh, these days. But yeah, actually breaking that identification so that the identification, uh, it becomes possible to, it, through montage, through having a sort of polyphony of voices and, and uh, to cr create identification with the community or with uh, a, a cause directly um, instead of identifying with uh, a single individual. Yeah, I just want to relate to that really quickly. In, in, in that context, do you think there's a kind of balancing act almost between the collective and the individual in your respective approaches in Amasu and in, in work or to whom the world belongs in that, you know, there are kind of, there are certain characters and figures that emerge and but but the but the 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 need to kind of emphasize the, the collective um as opposed to sort of like falling either into only one particular perspective or, or losing that sense of how these individuals kind of a a part of a wider community and, and in both films of kind of a wider struggle is is that a difficult kind of tension to to, to resolve within the film or was that something you even thought about or um I, th I mean, it's not when, when I talk about collective work. It's it's usually in the sense of ju not just like a you know sort of these uh, big uh, uh, this big masses word. You know, like oh, I'm working with the masses. You know, it's, it's quite uh, it's quite problematic at least for me. But rather that you talk about a sum of individuals with different ideas. And trying to find a balance between so this is reflected in the in the production process as well that we worked with that you know yeah we had the collective production but in the end of the day when I'm uh, when I have a camera pointed towards uh, a single individual or two or three people the, then the work becomes directly with these two people with these two or three people so that their own mise en scène if uh, if you want is uh, it, it, so there's this collective writing process, but there's also this, um, you know, the people who are directly being filmed, uh, their opinions and how they want to be portrayed was just as much, just as important than the collective, uh, as the collective. Um, so there, there, there is this balance. And I think that you do identify to certain people for different little moments, but it's, but it's short lived perhaps, and you find them, you kind of find them here and there throughout the film. So you, you have some common faces, but um, not to push it so much as the, so that you lose individuality. I think individuality is, 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 um, is, is what drives uh, um, collective pro progress. I think if we were all the same, if we were all doing the same, I mean, that would, be, that would uh, also be bad. Uh, so it is, I think uh, there is a tension between the two. Um, Maybe, maybe it's just a question of, of trying to find that balance uh, without falling too much here or there. And it also depends on the subject. I mean, for this particular subject, it was, it was uh, the best way was to have this sort of collective protagonist. Um, uh, maybe for another film, it's more interesting to have an individual protagonist. The question, it's not about saying, you know, having individual protagonists is in itself bad. But it's it's about saying, well, th this isn't the only way we can make cinema. It's not just about ind individual heroes. That maybe by uh, when we talk, especially when we're talking about subjects like this, it's about showing how historical processes are 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 um, collective processes that come from below, and not individual heroes which drive history. Uh, in the, 
just like it's it's often taught to us this way you know we, we were taught that you know this figure in history is the one who did this uh, this figure is the person who did this and then we lose all this sort of um uh, well how did that person come if it's a person who was elected how who elected them and why uh so you know th that's th that's also yeah so it's just finding this balance i think uh between the two but for me it's important that historical processes be accurately reflected so it's not just an individual making history so people feel mm -hmm. and i think the major um no well maybe i don't know if i should call it a message is that uh that we all have the capacity to change history, that it's, it's the sum of our actions. And that this, uh, a lot of times when we see political cinema, which puts individuals in the forefront, it does, and they're exceptional individuals, the great individuals, but it makes the, the rest of us feel maybe that we're not like this person, that we aren't capable of contributing. Um, and during the Egros, actually, when people would say, okay, well, uh, the writing Egros, people would say, uh, well, you, you should film us doing, uh, picking herbs you should film us fixing the pickup truck you should film us doing this but these were the way that all these individuals saw their contribution to the movement that it, uh, it was a sum of small gestures or movements that accumulated into this larger uh, historical movement um, so that's kind of yeah for, for me i guess i always um knew that i wanted to make um a film about the place itself um so obviously it was it was important to find some characters that you know put me in touch with with the story but for me it was also documenting yes the miners but also the 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 place the architecture the landscape uh, the everyday um as i was telling you before. So I always had a, a sense that the film was going to be about the place, the mining valleys, and not so much. Because um, I wanted to talk about a community that was in extinction, almost. Uh, and that's why I guess I use that voiceover of a sort of foreigner who approaches this place as, as an anthropologist doing a study on a, on a civilization that is, is vanishing. Um, so for me, it was always that idea of, of, of portraying the place itself. Yeah, I think that, that kind of question of place is, is, is really important, you know, in, in, in so many ways. And I think that, um, but there's also a question of history, which you've, you've, you've both touched on. And I think there's something interesting in, in whilst I can see so many kind of similarities in, in the two films, I think that, that whilst in, in, um, in Nadir's film, the kind of the political struggle feels urgent and direct and, and, and you're, you're sort of documenting it as it's, it's happening in certain points, you're also referring back to a longer sort of decades old struggle. In in um, in in your film, as you say, it also feels like there's a. Um, you've already said archiving. It feels like you're archiving that struggle almost to to educate. And you do mention this and in the inclusion of the school and the children of kind of you know educating future generations who are so disconnected from this. And also a fact that and you get this, I think, in that in that later scene where where the discussion is going on, a sense that for many. You know the, the struggle is, is, is all you know and this is not to be too sort of pessimistic but the struggle is all is already over right and it's how how do we salvage what we can and try and you know move forward from a situation that feels overwhelmingly as if as if um you know the forces of you know um the state and um neoliberalism and have, have kind of have, have sort of you know evacuated that sense of community and class consciousness and I mean, could, could you say sort of in response to what what Nadir was was talking about there around history, how you approach that kind of question of history and, and multiple viewpoints and creating a history that you don't also don't seem to shy away from from um, you know a kind of the, the factions and the divisions that are there. You don't want to present a sort of like a a utopian or perhaps a naive presentation of of the kind of the mining community or the working class community as sort of you know all united and, and sort of moving in the same direction and having the same opinions um yeah i mean i guess i was just maybe i'm not gonna answer this quite yet but when, when you're talking about you know um educating uh, 
the generations and and obviously i feel i feel that and that, that's why i also documented the school where i where i went to um in which there are like seven times less students now that they were when i was there and i feel that there is uh, there is a very um strong disconnection between these new generations and the history uh, of the community and sort of I guess the necessity of creating this film is making the story um, uh, to resist. I, I just wanted that the story to be documented perhaps for future generations. I don't know so much it is to educate anybody but for at least to to make the community reflect on their present and their past and, and, and to think as well about what future, you know, do we have? Um, if the modes of subsistence and of living that we knew are, are kind of gone. Um, and this is something that I, I, I kind of saw in Nadir's film because um, their mode of living is based on the very resistance and a struggle against repression now today, not as a past thing like in my film, um, and this is taught and passed through the generation. So you, you see how the, the children are learned this uh, and they are made part of it. Um, so I felt that the moment the community gives up and doesn't carry these lessons of the past through the, these generations, that this link is lost. Um, and in a way, when you lose that link, the dangerous seed of the extreme right can be easily planted, which is something that is happening in my community now, as it is happening in many communities, in many deindustrialized communities in, in I guess, uh, Europe and, and, and the US and so on. Um, so that's something that worries me as well, the disconnection of the new generations with, with their past and with our history. Um, um, yeah. Nadir, do you want to respond to that in relation to those kind of questions of the education and, and, and kind of archiving or presenting that the history of that struggle and, and what your experiences were, you know, being part of the the the, the kind of the resistance movement who were occupying the um, Mount Alaban and, and the, you know, the actual, the uh, cut off the, the, the water supply to the, to the silver mines. Is there anything? Yeah. Uh... I mean, it was it was also for us a part of uh, of a conscious process of of archiving for transmission, um, and that um, that we we believe that you know we we all, everybody knew in the movement that one day it's going to to end, and that's what happened. Um, but that there needed to be something, some sort of trace left for the generations that uh, come afterwards. Um, the, the way that they speak of it is they say, well, you know, the 1986 uh, movement, we have no photos and no videos. We just have oral poetry um, passed down as oral epics, which recount the events. In 1996, we had the oral poetry, but we also had some photos. Um, so this time we want to have the oral poetry, the photos, and uh, video and sound recordings that can be left uh, for the future generations, um, and uh, these. I mean, in each, you know, the, the poetry of of eighty six was what allowed the ninety six movement. The ninety six movement's poetry uh, allowed for the two thousand eleven movement, and um, and it's it's this kind of transmission that that. Uh, I mean, we were conscious of this 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 uh, need for transmission for for keeping this story uh for later for we, i mean to the to the degree that we were also recording much more than we needed for the purposes of our of just archiving so we have uh especially for oral poetry because it's it's tradi a tradition that's disappearing um so it was very important for us to archive these these uh poems uh as well and archive the movements uh, in general and, and I, f I feel that also creativity, is, I, I saw that like, it's so important in, in the community that you document that there, because you, you could see how, you know, it's not only in this like oral traditions through poetry and singing, but it is also like you see someone taking photos and, and you know, the very act of making the film. And, and I think it's so important. And I, I guess I saw that 
reflected in a way in the small group of miners that I that I work with. Um, in as much as when when they were trying to 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 create a new union, they were full of ideas and they would meet and they would you know make some uh, posters and they will just write. Uh, a magazine that would print it, that would take it to the pit. They, they would just be always trying to to create something. And the moment that there is no creativity, I feel that that the resistance, you know, sort of dies out as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I actually wanted to to ask you because in in middle in, in middle there, there's this um, there is the you know there I didn't show the uh, the 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 mine workers uh side of the story i really focused on the peasants and the part-time sometimes part-time workers that uh, were a part of the community and be actually because starting in the 70s in mining uh, in mining zones all over morocco with the with the uh the state did was that they started um um so they started they started they uh, they started stopping communities from working in the mines that are near them. So the people of Imedar, their grandparents worked at the mine, but then starting in the seventies, uh, they started bringing workers from other places as long as they were from somewhere else. And the idea was behind, that behind it was that if you had uh, a community that was also working at the mine that's, uh, that's next to them, then eventually if there is a general strike at the mine, it's going to translate to widespread community support, protests, shutdowns, all sorts of actions that could completely paralyze the mine. Mm. So, um, so they started, that's why the, the, the people who work at the mine don't care much for the environment because it's not theirs. Uh, so there's this kind of tension between the, the workers unions at the mine, a very a huge tension um, and um, I mean, they, the, 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 the workers mean, uh, union started uh, basically putting out all these statements against the, 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 the movement saying that, uh, I mean, they were really uh, attacking the, the movement uh, because it wasn't in their interests. Because, mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if there was this sort of, because you, in the beginning of the film, you speak about uh, the, the natives or those who, who and then these people who start these mining, uh, this mining town that developed. Um, was there a tension between these two groups, those who worked the land and those who worked in the industry? Well, not really, because as long as the, the, the mines began, they just took over and everybody became a miner. So there was not such tension. So that was the only means of subsistence. And, and not only everyone who lived there, uh, start working in the mines, but people um, immigrated from all over Spain to work in the mines. Um, so everybody was a miner. I mean, there was no other choice. You know, maybe you had some land and and you know uh, harvested for yourself, but really everybody worked in the mines. Um, okay. So there was not that tension, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I guess it's interesting what you were you saying because. Um, you know, when the capitalists created the mines and the mining companies, they also created um, towns that were next to the mines. And sometimes, because it is a very, you know, the mining valleys, they're, they're quite mountainous um, and they're quite isolated, the towns. That, so they will build uh, towns very separated from other towns so that the communities wouldn't communicate. And if there was a strike in one pit, they wouldn't know in the other pit. So, you know, there was also, th th there was that kind of like um, wanting to separate the community from the start, but that, that was from, from the, the owners of, of the mines. It's that kind of divide, yeah. and, divide and conquer, isn't it? You know, keeping, Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. keep ensuring there's that division. I think also in your, in, in your film as well, Elisa, you, you make the point that the, 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 the communities, that there was a sense of, of, of a strong sense of community, but the actual physical architecture and the buildings that were constructed in a way were um, functioned to sort of like separate the workers and the families and, and place them in conditions that were not necessarily conducive with, with, with fostering a sense of community. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think architecture was was very important, um, but but also the fact, and you know, that during most of the strikes and and you know, then I mean, I guess what I want to say is like then there was a dictatorship as well, and and that sort of uh, made the the struggle is much more difficult because people couldn't organize and so on so you know um to the and and these i'm talking at like the first half of of, of the 21st century in the, the the middle of the 21st century when people were trying to organize not only they were separated by you know living in those conditions in separate in separate isolated uh, towns and they were exploited but also that you know it was a dictatorship that in which people couldn't uh, have reunions and, and, and unions and, and political parties and so on. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you, Nadir was also talking about, you know, the, the use of, of poetry and the oral tradition and the way in which that's incorporated, you know, and poetry becomes part of the resistance of documenting as well these, these, these struggles and, you know, is used really beautifully in, in, in the film. Um, I wonder, in in your uh, approach, Elisa, did, did you feel that there were sort of existing uh, community traditions of storytelling or there were other cultural forms that that, 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 that you were able to sort of like um, identify and, and try and incorporate or is that not, you know, I, I can't I can't see in the film as sort of a, a, as, as clear a, a line, say, to the use of poetry as a form of resistance and, but maybe there are things that I'm missing in the subtleties of the, of, of the, of the, Culture. Yeah, I mean, not so much. There, there are specific, you know, um, ways of singing and songs. And in fact, a friend of mine made, made a film which is called Songs of a Revolution, which is very much based on the songs that were created during the Asturian 1934 revolution. Um, uh, but I didn't want to focus so much on, on that part, I guess. Um, and you know that there, there is, there is, there are songs that exist that the miners always sing, and so and so. And there is a, there, there are choirs of miners. Um, so there is a, there is a tradition in that sense. But um, yeah, I didn't want to include um, that. I guess, yeah, because I feel that before I made my film, I have a friend who made a film, a previous film about about the mine, the miners' strike in two thousand and twelve. And he he uh, he had a lot of these themes, and he had a lot of like songs, um, the minor songs and so on. And I just wanted to deviate a little bit from what he did, you know, and kind of like take over uh, from the twenty twelve uh, mining strike, and you know, create create something different. You know, what comes after that? So so in a way. Um, yeah, I never really considered, I guess, uh, using the songs. And, and, and Nadir, in, in, in Amusu, there's also, a, a, you know, you've talked about the importance of, of, of poetry, but there's also, the, coming the other way, there's a, there's a sort of um, collaboration that you have and a, and a point of education as well, I suppose, about giving the, the, the means of cinema production to the... Um, to the community and allowing them to express themselves through that. Could could you say a little bit about your experience of that and the perhaps the the way in which there was a, a, a synthesis or a crossover between you know the the, the traditional um, forms of, of of poetry and expression that way and how that translated into the actual um, you know the, the the perhaps the aesthetic or the the, the approach that you took as a filmmaker. I think um, maybe the the reason that um... It, it was so important to to do that is because uh, I'm working in a context where where uh, a post-colonial or a neo-colonial context where uh, cinema is still um, I believe I think uh, still engaging in uh, mimetism of whatever is happening in Europe or in North America. Um, so we're using the same modes, the same ways of expression. It kind of just looks, for, for a lot of recent films at least, I think in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, you still had filmmakers who were trying to look at ways to decolonize uh, because it's still fresh. They lived through, especially the first generation like Buoneni, they lived through the colonial period. 
and they were writing very much about uh, also using oral, well, Buenani especially, um, was writing about using oral poetry and oral traditions to decolonize and find new ways of expression that were unique to, to North Africa, not in this sort of uh, chauvinistic way of saying, you know, we reject all that is European, but saying, well, we need to develop a, our own language. It's okay if we use some things from, you know, uh, from Europe, but it, it shouldn't just be uh, copy paste. Um, so that's why oral poetry for me was, was quite important. And so uh, I had done quite a bit of research on oral poetry before the film and was conscious of it uh, before I even started shooting. But during the, the process, you realize that it's actually that this oral poetry is so much more important to the community than I had like than, than I had uh, than I had previously thought. Um, they had a troop of Ahidus and they would go to the to the weddings all over, there's a wedding season around August every year in the region. And they would go from wedding to wedding uh, doing this ahidus, you know, this ahidus dance where they stand in line. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a peasant tradition. They stand in line, they would sing. And it was, it's, it's basically like slam poetry. They would insult uh, those who were working with the, with collaborating with the mine. And they were, they were doing counter propaganda through these traditional oral mediums. So, and it was just a part of daily life. They would sing all the time. They would say poetry all the time. And there's a proverb even, uh, an event without its poem is an event which never happened. So I didn't realize how, in, um, how in, in rooted it is in, 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 in the, the society, especially in the Southeast. I mean, you, in our whole culture, it's supposed to be like that. But for us who are coming from urban context, we've lost quite a bit of that. And it's, uh, it was important for me to show how important th this is to our to our uh, to our traditions to to basically uh, yeah to find a way new ways of expression uh, that were unique to us uh, so basically to find a way to decolonize but and also to show that it's not something that's just kind of consigned to a museum or a very sort of um, you know um, very sort of um, anodyne folkloric interpretation of how that poetry is used but like you said it's something that's living and evolving and is and is entirely relevant to you know to 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 the way in which the the not only the identity of the media but also the way in which they see a means of communicating and expressing themselves and resisting you know i love that analogy you have between slam poetry and and what they're, they're doing with these you know at, at, at the weddings for example so it's kind okay. of and it's 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 also a popular it's a popular form. It touches uh, it it touches people um, in the community. It's not something that's coming from outside. It wouldn't be like if I was to put some sort of classical music. No one would identify with that there. So we're looking. You're looking at a popular form that's still living, uh, even though the state likes to think it's dead and to put it in museums and to put it in for tourists. And it's it's. Um, and especially because it's this tradition of Im Diezen, these kind of sort of troubadours who went from village to village, uh, were speaking truth to power uh, historically. They were the ones who, you know, when the French radio was saying that everything is under control, the Im Diezen were traveling from tribe to tribe, telling them, you know, over the, on that side of the mountains, there is a resistance movement going on. And it, it, was, it was an important part of the, so integrating it into the film was very important for me. It's like the, the kind of West African tradition of the griot is, that, is yeah. that, you know, as a social commentator, as well as a storyteller, right, and the importance of, of, of that. Sorry, Elisa, I think I... I, I, I no, wait. no, I just want to ask, before I forget, I, I just want to ask Nadi, who owns the silver mines? Is it the state or is it...? It's, uh, it's uh, no. So it's a bit by the state, by a pension fund. Mm. Um, I think it was like 10% or something like that. Uh, and then um, about the majority is owned by Menegem, a mining company. And if you look at what, and you, you sort of, you know how it is with the neoliberal uh, structures nowadays, you kind of have to trace things. So you have the Emedor mining company is part of the Menegem mining company, which is part of the Royal Investment Holding. So it, the majority is owned by the, the Royal Palace uh, in Morocco. Okay. Um, what one other kind of um, sort of question or, or topic I wanted to to sort of 
move towards is, you know, we talked about the collaborative nature of these projects of, you know, the, the importance of them being embedded in community and also the, you know, the, the, the way in which you, you kind of, Nadia worked and, and Alisa, you were kind of um, working with the, um, with, 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 with not only with members of the mining, of the, the miners, but also and members of the, the wider community. I, in, I wondered also if we could talk about this kind of the, the, how, how you you deal with this sort of um, the position of the filmmaker as being simultaneously an insider and an outsider. Um, I mean, obviously, Nadia, this is a community that you are you are not from, but you you've come and and you're working with them as an activist. You've lived with them. You're kind of very much um, aligned with them politically and in terms of their 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 struggle. Um, Elisa, you know, this is, as you said, you know, you filmed the school that you you attended as, 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 as a child. And and I wonder if you could say a little bit about how, um, you know, as, as, as filmmakers, you, you deal with that that negotiation between um, working with 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 the people and the community. But in, in, in relation to, you know, moving between that position is sometimes feeling inside and outside of, of, of community. And, and I just I'm just interested as to how you kind of. You, you navigate that as filmmakers. Could you give me just one second? My my computer is going to uh, needs to uh, needs to be charged. Of course, of course. I'll yeah, right back. yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> uh, for me, I guess I, I've you know, I even though I haven't been leaving there for many years, you know, um, I I don't feel like an outsider at all. You know, I feel very much part of the community. So when I go there even if it's like meeting people that I didn't know because they're from a different town or, or I, I, I feel a way, I, I feel that I belong. And so I, I don't see, I don't think they see me as an outsider, even though I want to, you know, document their, their lives and so on. I think they very much see me like one of them. So for me, it was really easy to, to integrate and, and, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, in, in small towns, uh, my experience is like all over the world where the places where I've been uh, people are really um, when you want to do something with them they really engage uh, and especially in if you're part of that community I think you know you have great responses from people to participate in the film and and to help you in any way they can and you know I, I feel like they see me and I have their accent and and you know I, I know their story because I, I, I you know experience it so, so for me, it's, it's important that making films as part of the, the, you know, being filmmakers and document the things that we know and the place that we, we come from. Um, and that, that's really important for me. Um, and, you know, I want to continue to make films in Asturias about Asturias. And, and um, yeah, I feel that that's, that's what I should be doing. So I feel, I, I feel very much like part of the community? Um, for me, I was not a part of the community, so, uh, as you know. Um, uh, I don't speak uh, Tamaz yet either, I barely speak it. Uh, so I was also an outsider um, in terms of language. Uh, but there were other things that allowed me also to be, I'm also an insider in some senses, in the sense that I was engaged in political activism uh, for, uh, for uh, around the same, about the same time the movement started. We had uh, an urban movement called the February 20th movement in 2011 with all the uprisings that swept through the, the, the North African region. So we were part of this inside activist or uh, this, this, this political movements, uh, I mean, February 20th and Imedar were happening around the same time. So there was this connection. Um, and uh, there's also another connection that I myself, although I'm not from that community in particular, um, my mother comes from a rural region uh, and my, uh, my mother's side especially, um, uh, a lot of them are still peasants who still work the land. So there is this this relationship to the land, but not with that particular land. Um, uh, so th these were the things that, I guess these two uh, latter, the two latter elements were what uh, allowed a connection to happen, especially since I was 
going there before even, I wasn't even thinking of picking up a camera and, in, in, uh, and, and starting to film this movement in the beginning, for, at least for the, the almost two years that this was the case. Um, I was going there in solidarity. Uh, I was taking friends who were, you know, friends from Black Lives Matter came to Morocco and I took them there so that these kind of connections are made. Uh, there were uh, Native American activists that came uh, and um, we, went, we went there. Um, and also I was helping them write statements, translate to English, graphic design, digital campaigns, you know, activist kind of uh, organizing work. Um, and so that's how the relationship started. And then the, they actually asked me to make a short film for the, the climate change conference that was happening in Marrakesh because the mining company was one of the main sponsors and they wanted international activists to know uh, that just 300 kilometers away from where the conference was being held, the main sponsor of the conference was doing, uh, was, 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 uh, is polluting, uh, is oppressing, etc. And so that's how the, that's, that's the moment around the climate change conference where the idea for a feature film was born kind of in a mutual uh, way. It wasn't me coming and just saying, I'm going to make a film about you. It was more of a kind of a, an incremental development. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting as well. That that kind of way in which you see in the film, the way in which the 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 very localized struggle actually, you know, extends out in in a form of transnational solidarity politically to other struggles. And and a, a, as you said, you know, there's sort of um, you were bringing um, sort of like members of the Black Lives Matter, um, you know. A, protest group to to see you know to in solidarity with the people of him are there there's also i know sort of their connections to sort of groups in italy and algerian anti-fracking organizations but also that understanding of how they can connect such a localized struggle through you know the means of um you know social media and, and digital uh, you know communications technology there's that lovely moment in the film where the the, the two men are, are, are sitting under the tree and taking a photo and sort of talking Talking about putting that onto social media but also showing an understanding of how connected they are to the land and the locality but also how connected they are to, to the outside world and there's a real sense of I think optimism and possibility of that of, of, of that solidarity sort of moving beyond the the very kind of localized struggle that, that they're involved in which I find really really positive and really sort of optimistic in in, in your film. Right and I mean uh, I was just one of, uh, the way I spoke before, it made it feel like maybe I was doing the connections, but I, actually I was just one of the connections that they were already making. I mean, I, I, uh, they, like you said, they have contacts, people all over the world. Um, and I was just one of the, these people that brought in the idea of cinema in particular, but that's, but that's about it. I mean, they had, uh, you know, they, they traveled to climate change conferences. They went to other uh, regions in the world to see what was happening with mining companies. And, and so, like you said, it, it, that the film kind of comes into this transnational solidarity. Uh, and um, let me ask you. And what's interesting, Elisa, that in, in your film is that, that kind of possibility of that link through to sort of a, a historical understanding of, of class consciousness through cinema with the inclusion of the, <laughs> the, of the very famous sequence from, from Kula Vamp. You know, how important was that to include that and also to include the response of the, you know, of the community watching that in the, in the film itself? Was that something that came to you very early or what was the inspiration for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I watched, I think I watched Kula Vampe, um, when I started to conceive this film, like maybe a couple, couple of years, three years before I, I started writing something. Um, and just as an anecdote, um, when I watched that sequence in the train, it sort of resonated with some news that I was reading at the time in the, in the Asturian newspapers about how um, Goldman Sachs was um, buying Colombian coal and stockpiling it in, a, in, a, in Gijon's Quay just to speculate with with the coal price, and this was during the economic the last economic crisis. And I thought that idea resonated 
so much with you know the, the discussion in the train when they're talking about um, coffee burned in Brazil for for the speculation. Um, but also, you know, the inclusion of the scene. Um, I think it, I made the choice because I wanted to trace lines to the outside uh, rather than just focusing so much about these mining valley. I wanted to to maybe make a comment or or, or maybe uh, connect, you know, the situation in Asturias with with how. Uh, capitalism operates globally um, and I was I was kind of interested in highlighting the points of convergence between uh, both moments in time uh, when the film um, Kule Vampe was shot in 1931 uh, and and with the um, the crisis after, after the 2008 crisis um, because both films showed a demobilized class uh, a demobilized working class, uh, but perhaps I think I was most interested in comparing the resolution of both films because Kule Vampe has an optimistic message and I think it serves as a vehicle to, to articulate a class consciousness. And, and I think work um, sort of represents the moment in which the industrial societies uh, that made possible the working class movement have transformed so much that mm, that idea of utopia that existed in the left-wing politics of the 20th century is no longer possible, if, if it ever was. So in, in that sense, like work has a more uh, pessimistic approach, a pessimistic tone to Kula Vampe. Um, and I guess th those were the reasons why I wanted to, to include this sequence, but also, you know, I, I enjoy that moment in which, you know, we projected the film and I invited a lot loads of people from the community and they, they watched the film and then we, we had a talk afterwards um, about about Kule Vampe and, and you know the, the situation of, uh, that the film reflects but also um, it, it allowed me to, to reflect on the things that I was filming and, and know more about the community itself because I guess one of the things that I missed um, because we um, we premiered the film at the end of 2019, so I missed a lot of uh, screenings of the film, and I wanted this film to to have a lot of screenings in the community to you know uh, talk and reflect on on the film. So I didn't have time chance to to do that, um, um, you know, and and. and I'm, I'm saying this because I, I found that Kula Vampe, when we projected Kula Vampe, we did have like a, a really good conversation and dialogue with people about the film. And there, there's this connection there, isn't there, to, to what goes on in, in, in Amusu, Nadir, with the way in which, um, you know, you, you bring films to the community and you have those, those collective screenings and something about the, also, the, there's a resonance, I think, there in relation to third cinema, you know, the idea, of course, the sort of like fabled screenings of Out of the Furnace, whereby, you know, the film will be stopped at particular points for discussion. Um, I think that again is something that seems really important here. It's not just about the collective process of making these films, but the collective process of, of viewing and discussing them. Could, could you say a bit about a bit about that, um, both of you, in terms of you know your experience, say Lisa, in relation to the screening of of, of Kula Vampa and and Nadir, your your experience of, of of bringing those films and sort of setting up a, a film festival actually in the protest camp. For the the screenings that we did before the <clears throat> before and during the shooting process process of the film were very much part of the, this democratic pro uh, this uh, this democratic process behind making of the of the film because um, b basically all of this is part of uh, what I think is a a way for me to remove that lack of balance or that imbalance of power. Uh, that exists between someone who's carrying the camera and someone who's in front of the camera. And so by, by showing films uh, by sh to people, showing creative documentaries to people who uh, uh, only have television and state television in, in particular, uh, is gonna be a way uh, of helping them understand what exactly it is I want to do 
uh, that I'm not there as a journalist. I'm not there because they they were used to journalists. They were used to just speaking directly to the camera with having a mic, like a physical microphone in front of their face, this sort of uh, situation. So, and so the idea was that if they saw uh, uh, the documentaries, uh, sort of like the one that I wanted to make, then they would they would understand how to also um, uh, say no to my propositions, that they would know enough, that they would have seen enough films to be able to say, well, no, what you're saying here, because uh, we have, as filmmakers, we have a tendency to try to control things, right, in our, in our films. And, 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 and so um, uh, maybe one proposition that we really want to do uh, we might just give the impression that that's how we, we do things, that's the only way to do it. Or, but by showing them films, they could say, well, no, it's, there's a different way of, you know, the documentary we saw the other day. Well, in that documentary, there was this and this and this. So why do you have to do it like this? Um, so it just kind of gives them uh, more, uh, enough understanding about cinema or just enough understanding about cinema to have discussions that are, meaningful where I'm where I'm not just I, I'm the one who knows and you don't know anything and uh, trust me I'm the filmmaker sort of sort of situation. Extending so just, entirely your kind of your your democratic approach to the you know the idea of not only access to the means of production but also access to, to the means of um of 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 the of the images and understanding those and debating them and and so yeah and Elisa do you do you want to to sort of respond to that in relation to what we see in 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 work I mean, you know that i mean what's the is the is there a strong kind of um film going tradition within those communities how did that you know what was the discussion like of of cooler vampa after you 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 screened it yeah i mean it, it it was a very lively discussion i think when people are given the chance to see certain films you know they really engage with them. And um, for instance, when, when we uh, premiere work, you know, there was a discussion that lasted uh, a really long time uh, because people really care about what they're watching and they have their own ideas and they put, put them to you and then you share ideas. And that's what's enriching about this experience. That's ultimately why you make the film because you want not so much to make a change or, or anything like that, but you, you want to uh, make people reflect and have a conversation with you and, and, and learn from, from, from the feedback that you get from them. Um, but I have to say, when, when we were, um, when I was editing the film, I didn't really show the film to all of the miners, just two of them. Uh, so most of them, they only saw it uh, in the premiere. Uh, I didn't want them to see the film. I felt that I had to find, you know, find the film before I show it to them. So in um, that sense, yeah. yeah. And, um, and how was that response from from both of you to from the community to 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 the films that were that that were finally on the screen and that were you know being submitted and having such success at festivals, international festivals? Yeah, I mean, for me, as I said, you know, that the few. I only had the chance to attend two, two screenings there because then, you know, the pandemic started yeah. and I just missed all of it. But, you know, I'm hoping to to go back soon and, and being able to show the film and, and have like more discussions. Because I haven't really, I haven't, it has been shown in the in the mining communities, but I, I, I wasn't able to go, so. Okay, and there's not been a sort of online discussion that you've had with them. You're waiting to have that in person. To sort yeah, of... I, I want. Yeah, I want to take the you know the film to the cinema mm. and and yeah. Well, I can understand that it's a kind of special moment, isn't it? And you want to kind of have that that you know that's important. It's, it's a sort of like a, another stage within the within the the, the film film's mm. life itself. Nadir, could you say a little bit about that? About the you know I, I know that the, the community were obviously involved through Agrao in in kind of the, the process. Of, of, of editing as well but what what has been the response um from 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 the from the community to the film uh well um it depends on who you speak to like i said at the end of the film there was a lot of fragmentation in the community uh, i would say most have uh have adored the film but there is this uh, small group uh, that basically 
uh, I would maybe there were rumors being spread by the by the state itself, saying that basically, I know after the film, uh, even during the film, that uh, the film money, I bought an apartment in New York, New York things like this, um, and. <laughs> Um, but this kind of thing happens uh, quite often in Morocco because people are are so often so exploited in by by television, uh, by tourists who come just photograph people without asking, and by magazines people just find them, the you know, people end up divorcing because uh, you know who especially for women it's it's quite it's quite um, it's quite bad. So there is this. You know, there's always going to be this, uh, but generally, I mean, it was um, people have been very in favor of the film and the premiere. We had we had the premiere at the protest camp, um, and it went uh, it went great. And I, that's all. I don't know how much I can say more because it's it's so many people. You can't really gauge. Uh, you know, the ones that are closest to me are always going to be the ones that are most in in, in favor or the most positive. So I can't. I, I have difficulty gauging. Yeah, I, I remember now um, in one of the screenings, uh, I there was a man um, who was quite offended by the Marxist approach of the film to the issue. And I'm like, well, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> so there was a bit of discussion uh, about that. But yeah, overall, he was well uh, accepted it. Well, my son. Okay, we have about just over 10 minutes left and we have a question, um, you know, which we want to leave time for it to sort of, um, you know, resonate and develop and for you to sort of have, have an ex exchange about this that we've been asking all of the panels, all of the filmmakers who've been in, in conversation, um, which is related to the, you know, the focus of the, of, of, of the festival itself and, and kind of the, a, a broader question around this idea of folk and folk cinema. So, so the question's in two parts, really. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the question and then I'll, I'll, I'll step back and I'll just let you guys let the kind of fireworks of thoughts sort of evolve as you, um, as, as you give me your, your, your thoughts and your responses. So the first part of the question is, what do you understand by the term folk cinema? or a people's cinema? Um, and what is its significance for you? And, and then the broader part of that is, and what do you think about that, the kind of, um, not only the resonance with your own work, but also in, in sort of world global film culture more generally. So if we kind of go with that first part of, what do you understand by the term folk cinema or a people's cinema? What, do, what does that mean to you? Well, I suppose to me it's, it's, it means um, a lot of things that we've been talking about today. Uh, I suppose it means uh, resistance, it, it means community, collectivity, tradition, uh, you know. Being part of a community, being able to, to document uh, a community, to carry uh, certain traditions and, and yeah. I don't know, not either. Um, well, maybe for, I have trouble with the word folk um, just because maybe it's our context, uh, the post-colonial context where, um, where uh, the colonizers basically uh, labeled anything that wasn't, um, anything that was native uh, as folk and uh, whatever their high and uh, whatever high culture they had in, in France was was not full. Um, so I have a, a, a different relationship maybe with the word folk, but I do understand that in the European context, it doesn't have the same meanings and it has to do with more with what I would call popular uh, arts instead of like folk arts. So I would say popular cinema instead of saying folk cinema. Uh, but it's a word that needs to be deconstructed. We have to kind of sit together amongst ourselves down here and, and to kind of deconstruct this. And we're starting to do that a bit, but it still needs more, more thought. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, for me, a popular cinema is a cinema that's, that kind of <clears throat> expresses uh, um, 
expresses working people's, or I, I don't know if I should say working people, because there's people, a lot of people who don't work in Morocco, uh, who, are, who, are, who are less privileged than the working people. Or, um, so basically anyone from a class that, uh, that doesn't have the means of expressing themselves and which uh, can either directly express themselves um, as we're, we're seeing some, this a very unique new movement in, in Morocco of uh, w working class youth getting together in, in, in their neighborhoods and making short films, short fiction films. Um, so it can be direct like that, or it can be collaborations between the uh, filmmakers like myself who have, let's say we could call it, say more experience with communities and allowing uh, uh, direct expression and, and just kind of transmitting their voices, um, but in a more uh, active way, you know, not, not, not sort of this extractivist, uh, you know, we just take your voice and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take it to the rich people so they can cry for, for about 60 minutes or an hour and a half. Uh, and then it's all, it's all done and finished, but yeah. So for me, there has to be some sort of uh, militant elements in what I call popular cinema. Um, and without it, it just becomes maybe just becomes populist cinema. Uh, the fine line, I, I think. Elisa, yeah. do you want to, to, to respond to that? And to, you know, is there any additional thoughts that that brings to you about the, the resonance of it and the significance of it? You know, maybe thinking in terms of like Asturian cinema as, as having an identity because that's something we haven't touched on but I know that that's also a sort of just as Nadia said there's sort of like a growing kind of um group of, of, of young filmmakers who are sort of taking control of their means of means of kind of production and image making and telling their own stories but also this film is part of a, a growing group of sort of Asturian filmmakers right yeah you, you know? I mean in, in a way um you know, following what Nadia was saying, you know, I think the cinema, as long as it is popular, as long as it reflects a community, you know, the working class, it has to be political. So in that sense, if we're talking about a folk cinema being a popular cinema, democratic cinema, it has to be militant, it has to be uh, political. And, and yeah, absolutely, you know, um, I feel that I am part of a bigger collective of people from our studios making film films now that have, you know, um, a political consciousness. Be, I think be, because we have grown up um, in a region that has been very political, in which there has been uh, loads of like uh, working class struggles, and like we've grew up doing that. So the notion that we have of cinema. It is um, of a cinema that has to be close to the territory uh, where it is made with the people, you know, telling the history and the stories of that place. Um, and, and, and being, yeah, just reflecting the, po uh, the politics of the films that we do, not just in the stories that we tell, but in, in how we tell them as well and, mm -hmm. and how we show our films, how we produce them and so on. And, and extending that, then the kind of final part of the question was about, I suppose, thinking again about this question of solidarity and transnational solidarity. Um, do you, what do you think about the significance of that, of, of, of sort of a, an understanding and a development of a, of a folk cinema or a people's cinema, if we want to talk about that, in, in sort of world film culture more, more generally? Do you see those as possibilities to make those connections? What's it, have you got any thoughts on that just to, just to sort of close with? Well, I think, you know, a festival like this is a great opportunity, uh, you know, for me to meet Nadir and, and know his work and, and create these sort of connections with, with filmmakers worldwide that otherwise, you know, I, I would have known. Um, um, but then I guess it's, it's just difficult because I think there is not a sense of of community or at least I don't feel it. You know, I think we, I, I, I've, feel myself like a part of this small community of filmmakers, but overall I, I see uh, cinema now as loads of like individual people making different stories. So yeah. 
no, in the sense in which there were collectives before, you know, in the 60s or, or, or earlier. I, I don't see that happening now so much. Um, maybe because it's the, it's the nature of the societies that we live in, or, it's, you know, yeah. I have no idea. Um, what, do you think do you, do you, yeah, what do you think of that? Um, <clears throat> I think, um, I think, well, maybe it's maybe I'm just talking about what the direction that uh, maybe I've been moving towards more lately is looking at is there a way of maybe thinking of vernacular this the vernacular aspect of folk cinema that it's not necessarily made for international audiences and because we've been battered so long with this idea of universal appeal and I think this is just the market speaking, you know, when they say universal, they're just, well, what they mean is not, you know, because in the end, at least from our perspective uh, in the global South, uh, universal can be just interpreted as Eurocentric or whatever works for the market for as many people as possible. So this vernacular aspect of saying, you know, it's okay for me to make a film that's only watched in a village. Mm. Um, and that, you know, maybe this, uh, uh, and that there, there are transnational influences. Maybe this film might go somewhere and just maybe it's just gonna go to Scotland and come back. It's not gonna go uh, because, you know, there's in Scotland, there's the folk film festival and, and which makes room for this kind of, the, the, these kinds of films that are not necessarily intended for uh, mass consumption. Um, so maybe folk cinema can be sort of something like that where it's uh, just like folk culture, you know, it's, it's um, local, it's quite localized, it's vernacular, uh, and it touches on the, the specificities of each place. Uh, and I think that there's no, nothing more universal, truly universal than that, these differences that we have as humans between us. And just saying, it's okay to have differences. I'm gonna make this type of cinema for this group of people, and, and that's completely okay. Um, but maybe that's for me the, the, the the, the future maybe of, of uh, a film of um, maybe we don't need this huge kind of uh, things. Maybe they're useful, yes, in this current context of capitalism because we need to live also and to survive, we need to get our films to these festivals so that we can, uh, so we can get some, some money back. Yes, okay, but you know, in the, in the ideal, at least for me, um, that's not necessarily the best uh, or most effective uh, you know, a way of making fi fil films. Okay, that I, th I think that's that's a great place for us to actually to, to wrap up. I'm conscious of, of, of time as well. I just want to say once again, thank you so much um, to, to, to our filmmakers, to Elisa and to Nadir for a really, really great, rich and wide ranging discussion. I've, I've you know, it's been a real privilege to sort of like uh, sit in on this and, um, and I, and I know that there's sort of, um, I, I can see that there's some pos there's a positive response coming through from, from the audience. And thanks once again, we really, really appreciate it. Bro, thanks, Will, and Nadia. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you. We should, and we should stay, uh, we should stay in touch, I think. Uh, Absolutely. For, for many, I, I mean, I, would, I, I need to put you in touch with a friend of mine who's working on a mining town that has going through the same processes here in Morocco. It's a different mining area, but similar dynamics. And he's an artist. Uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe there's something there. That could yeah, absolutely. Transnational. Uh. Okay, yeah. so that's an exclusive. You heard it here first, right? We've got, yeah. a, we've got a collaboration <laughs> on the cards. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much to both of you. And thanks to all the audience for, for joining. There's really positive comments coming through to, 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 um, to both our filmmakers. So that's great. Thank you very much. Um, take care, everyone, and um, we look forward to seeing you for for um, for, for our next um, session um, discussion with 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 our panelists. And um, please, you know, follow up on, on all the films that are in the program. And, and really, thank you to, to 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 our filmmakers and thanks to our audience for um, for being there as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>